pleasure to announce um, the next keynote now, which will be held by Francois Tathieu. Um, and he will talk about from sensor data to organized and reusable phenomic information. Um, he is part of an infrastructure called Emphasis and Elixir and Emphasis work very closely together on anything to do um, with plant sciences. So um, I'll stop talking here because um, Francois, you, you know a lot more about this. And um, yeah, we're looking forward to your talk. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot, Katerina. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, great. So yeah, from sensor data to organized and review the reusable phenomic information. So we are slightly downstream as uh, what uh, Alexi has uh, shown. It's a work uh, of uh, emphasis, but also the European project EPPN 2020. This is the French infrastructure. And you can imagine that we work very closely with uh, with Alexis and, and and we work closely with the Mayape and uh, Cyril Pommier is uh, one of the co-authors of this uh, paper. Okay, so um, we are interested by the phenotype. And in fact, we know that the phenomic information is uh, very time consuming, it's expensive, and we want to extract the maximum information from complex data sets. So something like a regional type of form, better where can we predict harvest time from an existing data set? And uh, there is a special case for plants that phenotypic uh, data set cannot be reproduced because the set of uh, environmental conditions uh, in which you did your experiment will never be repeated. So uh, the question is, can we infer plant behavior for new genotypes in new conditions and not only to analyze what happened in, in one experiment? This is based on the premises that uh, we may want to spend more time in data management to make uh, better use of less experiments, knowing that the cheapest experiment is the one that is already in a database or the one that we can infer from other experiments. And there are methods for doing that, and I will show it. Or perhaps even uh, the one coming from big data without any experiment. So, uh, but we have difficulties for that. And the main difficulty that uh, this graph is the same as we can have, for instance, for a human, but there is a special trick that plants are not homeostatic. This person, will, uh, regardless of condition, will have two legs, two arms, and one nose. Whereas for plants, uh, the structure completely changes with the environment. So you have here one plant in short day, one plant in long days, in the same genome, but the plant is actually completely different. And the, even the structure, the leferia, everything is different. So what we call phenomic data sets, it's the phenotype, of course, but it's not one phenotype, it's phenotypes with an S in environments with an S. And, uh, a consequence of that is that uh, because the phenotype highly depends on environmental condition, environmental data are actually part of the phenotype. They are not just a metadata because the phenotype is uh, only got in one set of environment. There is a second difficulty that we face is the uh, time variation of environment. So this is something that we can have in our current life, but for a plant is slightly different because actually every cell of a plant sends the fluctuating temperature or water status. If we, if it's cold today, I'm at 37 degrees. If it's uh, warm, it's, I'm still at 37 degrees. A plant will be in the morning at 11 degrees, every single cell, and in the afternoon, every single cell is at 35 degrees. So this is a major difference between plants and uh, humans, for instance. And even for the water, uh, we have plants that are fully turgid in the morning 
and that can be plasma light in the afternoon and uh, the following morning they will be turgid again. So we are in difficulty to define in this condition what is a water stress, except if you are prepared to say that a water stress is uh, what happens between this hour and this hour. So we need in fact to go further than this concept and consider the time courses of just about everything. This is because growth also changes over minutes. So we have here, for instance, during a day, we have night, day, night. Transpiration increases with the light. And we have leaf growth, for instance, that changes over minutes. So in the early morning growth plump goes, extremely, goes down extremely rapidly while photosynthesis increases. So you can imagine that, uh, again, the, the phenotype we have is completely time dependent and every single physiological mechanism is also uh, time dependent. Just take the consequence of that. We have an increase in photosynthesis during the day, so that the source increases, but the sink is actually decreasing. So a, a complete change in carbon status, etc., between time of day and between days as well over minutes again. So uh, if I take my graph of before, uh, OK, we need uh, environmental data, but we need time courses of environmental variables because things are varying uh, extremely rapidly. And every physiological mechanism will occur over minutes, not over days. But we're interested in yield that is over month. And that's the gap we want. To, to fill. Another obstacle for data reuse is uh, the spatial variability, uh, but uh, there was a game changer. So now we have a sensor network, we have the Internet of Things, so we can have environmental data in every single field if we want, and if we are too lazy uh, or to, to do that, we have environmental grid. So if we have any field in any place in Europe, we can get temperature, light, rainfall. So we are not obliged to characterize the environment as a, as a place, for instance, saying that in South it's uh, warmer than in North. This can be true, but not necessarily so. Uh, and this is an example uh, of, uh, okay, we are here in one field and these are different years. Uh, these are different times of year. And you can say for water deficit, for instance, that we can have, depending on the year, a water deficit at the beginning, at the end, no deficit at all, etc. So the site gives no information in, in um, environmental condition. Yes, of, of course, it's uh, more prone to have drought in the south. But uh, we, we can have a, a completely different uh, thing during our own experiment. So there is high risk of no conclusion from extensive data. Uh, we could say, OK, let's go to control conditions. But actually, you have exactly the same difficulty in control conditions. This is a greenhouse. These are three sensors for uh, light. That's the transmission of light. So it can be completely different. And you can see that from one place to another place of the greenhouse, of the uh, metals, we can have from uh, low to high light. And don't believe that a gross chamber is better. It's just exactly the same. So again, we have a high risk of no conclusion from expensive data if we are not considering very closely environmental conditions. So, what we need in information system to make use of uh, our data is, uh, as I said, environmental conditions that are part of the phenomenic uh, time courses, but also the precise x, y uh, position of sensor and uh, measure plant temperature. And this is what we call the phenomic data set. Okay, so what uh, what can we do? And here there are two possible strategies uh, that are valid, both of them, and I will il illustrate uh, each of them. So I can have a question. Okay, uh, this is 
too complicated for me, so I just want to relate genotypic means to env environmental indicators, and I build the environmental indicators to have to explain my uh, genotypic means. And this is basically uh, the, the, the strategy of uh, my epic of Elixir, and this has been presented before. There is another question, which is, I want to ex actually exploit all the spatial and temporal information, because again, I make uh, phenotypic data with a good definition. My environment changes uh, with a good definition. So I may want to explore all this variation. And this is more the view of the emphasis and non-emphasis uh, information systems. We have seen uh, my, um, PIPA yesterday that, uh, has basically this approach. OK, so I want to illustrate both of these approaches, uh, again, with the idea how can I make the best use of my phenotypic data by combining methods. Okay, so I begin with the first question. Um, so I want to relate genotypic means to environmental indicators. And uh, I will take an example of a multi-site uh, experiment, uh, 16 five years, two years, two watering treatments, so many data with uh, 252 genotypes, and we had yield variations. Uh, so this is in different fields. You can see that obviously, if the field is a well water and cool, yeah, the yield is better than in water deficit. But because these plants are uh, genotype, we can do uh, we can relate every part of the genome, every SNP in the genome, to yield and have what we call QTLs of yield. The only problem is that uh, if we do that in all these fields. It's basically mess. We have uh, 500 QTLs of yield that differ between fields. So it's very difficult to make any use of that. And uh, most of the breeders have lost patients and they are not interested in, anymore in QTLs of yield. Most of them. So uh, I want to show how uh, using decently the data sets can help in that. What we can do, OK, we have all these fields, but actually all these fields look like, to some extent, uh, we can classify them. And we have here what I call environmental scenarios. So we have here each line is one field. So we have temperature uh, during day and during night. We have a water potential capture with uh, potentiometers. And we can see that fields can be uh, clustered into scenarios. So for instance, these fields are cool, these fields are hot during day, but not too much during night. Those are hotter. Those are basically in mild water deficit. Uh, these are in a more serious water deficit. And what we can see is that this, for instance, this SNP that is here, that is an SNP for yield in some fields, Actually, it is negative in some, uh, it has a negative effect on yield in, uh, if you have a severe water deficit and it is positive on yield and, uh, and quite, a, quite a few in fact, uh, if uh, we have a mild water deficit and, uh, and it's hot. So, and this is not just for one field, this is consistent between fields. So if we group our fields, in scenarios, but not in, not, it's in scenarios. It's not necessarily in, uh, by places because this place can be with uh, this scenario one year, but this scenario the other year and the southern uh, place in, in Italy can look like uh, some years to a place in Italy, in uh, Germany. So uh, basically, nearly all our QTLs for uh, yield fell into this approach in which if we group fields with uh, environmental scenario, then we have a, a much better view of uh, what we have uh, yeah, otherwise. So environmental scenarios uh, making sense of messy data. 
Now, we may want to go further by using a uh, uh, phenotyping platform. You have seen uh, the one in Ghent uh, just before. So this is one in Montpellier. This is one in uh, Dijon with, uh, with roots. And the game here is to make uh, virtual plants. And once we have virtual plants, we group them into virtual canopies. And on these virtual canopies, we can make uh, quite a few uh, calculations. For instance, how my genotype uh, with this density can uh, capture light, where it capture light, etc. So every pixel here, uh, its color depends on the amount of light that it captures during one day, and you can do the same for uh, roots. So we can combine this information uh, with field information, of course. Uh, this is not for calculating yield. Uh, the best way to waste money is to uh, have yield in platform. But the platform is to try to better understand what happens uh, in the field. And I will give one example for that, which is a genomic prediction of maize yield across uh, European environmental scenarios. So we first, in the platform, characterized the progression of phenology. And believe me, uh, I don't show that, but the progression of, of phenology is the same in platform and in field, provided that uh, time is expressed in thermal time uh, corrected for temperature. So we have the characteristic of uh, each line here is a genotype. We have the characteristic of every genotype. And we can, for, for instance, calculate the, from the leaf uh, phenology. Uh, when is the floral transition, when is the silk initiation, etc. So we can position uh, um, phenological uh, phases. Okay, so once we have done that, and this can be done in platform, can be done in uh, platform in control condition, it can be done in platform like uh, what uh, Alex C showed uh, with the hyphen as well, but it's a place in which you have more data than in your network. Then what you can do is position uh, the, the flowering time, for instance, of each genotype on the time course of uh, light, water, temperature. And you can do that in uh, all sites. So what we do here is having what I call environmental indicator. So for instance, the mean light during flowering time. So I have just one figure per field. So uh, field one, uh, mean temperature will be 23, 23.4 in another field, etc. So we synthesize the information uh, per field. And then what we can do is, and we, we did actually, was to use these uh, environmental indicators to correlate with yield. And we saw quite close correlation between temperature, for instance, and yield and with a multiple regression, we could have the response curve of every single genotype of our 250 genotypes. Okay, so once we have done that, uh, we can do a genomic prediction because all these guys are sequenced, but not, not sequenced, but genotype. So we can do genomic prediction, but not of the yield itself, but on the response curves. Uh, uh, to light, to water, to temperature, and use, combine the genomic prediction of these slopes to actually the environmental conditions, uh, environmental indicators, in fact, uh, in each site. And then we can have a genomic prediction, but not only uh, of yield, average yield uh, in Europe, but in potentially every single site, every single year, depending on the condition in this part. And, and from that, we can go to what was presented this morning, addressing really the, the, the question with genotype within thousands of thousands. Uh, we can uh, have a prefer in thousands of fields. So this can be based on existing uh, genotypes, but it can be based also via genomic prediction to a non-existing genotype that uh, we just are planning to, to create. Uh, and, uh, this was the uh, in our prediction uh, this morning. Okay. 
So what was needed here? It was a variable energy compatible for field and control conditions. And it was environmental condition measured in the same way in the field and in control condition. So this is important. Everybody will agree that we need some degree of environmental condition in the field, but we need exactly the same degree of precision in, in control condition. So we can relate them. And actually we were relating the information in the greenhouse and in the field because we have exactly the same ontology for uh, variables uh, in, in both conditions. So what was kept here in uh, Elixir type uh, database, uh, my type database, and uh, this was in gen is for instance, we have the means per genotypes. So for instance, yield, grain number, but also file chrome, and that was done in platform, whereas the yield is in platform. And environmental indicators, which are again uh, something that uh, synthesizes the conditions uh, that plants had, for instance, during flowering time or during a certain time. So we don't use here the time cost. Uh, just know that if your indicators is uh, flowering time, uh, temperature during flowering time, then as I said here, uh, it will actually be different for every genotype. So the indicator will be different for any field, but also for any genotype. Okay, so this is the approach for relating genotypic means to environmental indicators uh, in field and platform. So here again, the time and spatial variability are already synthesized upstream of the information field. Okay. Now we can, uh, as I said, we can have uh, another approach, which is uh, making full use of temporal and spatial variability. And I will take uh, two examples for that. Uh, and that was a, <laughs> a hard experience for us. So we took, uh, we took samples for metabolome and proteome in our uh, platform. It was collected during one experiment. And uh, there was a large variability between plants within each genotype, so the heritability was low. And we had to struggle a lot to improve this heritability by taking into account the precise time of sampling uh, in minutes, and the sampling was done in two hours. The XY position of plant, because each plant had a different uh, amount of light, uh, and uh, the local light and temperature that we could uh, uh, obtained from our environmental uh, data set. So you can imagine that, uh, and from that, we began to have really repeatable uh, data for both metabolome and proteome, and we could predict something that happened in the field based on this information, but as long as we used all this information. So environmental indicators here were not enough. We needed individual information, and uh, here we need an information system that is slightly different from what is in MyAPE because uh, we need a genotype accession, some, but also sampling time, plant history, XY position of uh, every plant at sampling that can be different uh, later on. And this is nearly impossible uh, without uh, using static uh, web that we use in, uh, in our uh, information system. So this part is common with MyAPE. So we have sampled a plant that has an accession number, a variety, but we sampled uh, leaves and these uh, leaves are to this plant. So the samples are linked to leaves. They are linked with an experiment, uh, but they are linked with uh, the, the position and uh, the time, so we can just with some clicks get all this metadata and these metadata, the important is that they are generated automatically because to be honest, when we did that, we did that by hand and it took us weeks to recover all this information and now we can do it uh, within uh, seconds. Right, so time and special variability here are at the center of the information system. 
And I can give you another example. And uh, I presented you uh, this example of uh, uh, getting the leaf elongation rate of time. So here we have the variation with time. So we have a water deficit that is relieved. We have uh, every minute or so we have growth. And we want to use all the spatial variability and temporal variation to uh, drive the response curve. So we want to use it in the analysis rather than uh, consider that spatial and temporal variability are causing problems. And this is typically the sort of thing that we are doing. We have leaf elongation rate every 15 minutes, for instance. We have the environmental condition here, leaf elongation rate here. And we have uh, points that are here. And the interesting thing is that this response curve is common to cross chamber, to field, and to house. So we can characterize every genotype with this response curve and do some genetic uh, out of it and, and we do it and we can use it in models and we can use it in genomic prediction. So here, uh, basically, uh, the uh, the information system we use uh, is, is of course the same. So all of that is the same, but instead of uh, having one environmental condition, one environmental indicator uh, for one plant, we have a matrix and we have, for instance, several variables every 15 minutes, and we have the phenotype every 15 minutes. And this allows us to do this response curve. So here, as I said, time and spatial variability are at the center of the information system because we want to make use of it. So how does it work? Uh, and this is uh, common in EPPN 2020 emphasis in our infrastructure and, and PIPA works in the same way. So having your eyes for every single object in the local infrastructure, then having an information system uh, implemented in Node that allows uh, automatic generation of your eyes and decent variable names. Uh, we have the same principle that uh, Cyril has shown before, entity variable method unit. And uh, the last thing, this is in every node in uh, emphasis, but uh, we have web services linked in uh, all information system and we are using FEDER that uh, Showed and so finally, uh, our strategy, uh, we don't want to impose anything to anybody. So our strategy is to track rather than standardize because people are not terribly happy to be standardized usually. We want to mimic what the experimenters uh, do spontaneously and then formalize and then map in uh, existing ontology. And this is, for instance, the case of the FIS software that can be found in this uh, paper. It is also basically the, the case for PIPA. Okay, so finally, I would like to uh, synthesize uh, the complementarity of uh, information system in the uh, elixir and emphasis. So again, uh, I showed some examples of what we can do uh, with the Elixir MyAP information system. This was uh, my example with the field all over Europe. Here we have individual data are scholars, so they can be means of each genotype, uh, environmental indicators. Emphasis uh, is recalculate means and indicators because perhaps I don't trust how people did that. And uh, this is, and we want to use the spatial and temporal variability. And the examples are here are FIS and PIPA, and individual data are matrices. And everything this is built up in the identification, variable naming is common. So it's compatible and it's complementary. So finally, we are thinking in a system uh, in which here we have all the data, we can. Obviously, we calculate the genotypic means and environmental indicators from the data, and we can have automatic generation of uh, Elixir MyAP type information system based on this uh, method. To be honest, now it's done by hand, but uh, we need to progress uh, between that to have a 
potentially automatically related information system that actually responds to slightly different objectives. But uh, nobody's right, nobody's wrong. It's a different objective and it's uh, everything is useful. Uh, I showed the interest of both of them. But both of these information systems allow us potentially to make uh, much better use of uh, the existing data sets. Because again, reusing data sets is not just a question of uh, open science, it's our common practice now. We never do an experiment without uh, using exp formal experiment either of uh, ourselves or uh, of uh, other people, just because we cannot redo all experiments. And uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, I will be happy to see you in the session in a few minutes.